myself really lucky because I get to work on rain garden projects on a daily basis and that's probably the most rewarding job in the world anyway for a plant nerd it is. So <laughs> I'm really enjoying that kind of work and I love helping people create all that energy you have and that desire to do right and, and create a successful rain garden with that. So here are some examples of some rain gardens we've done in the past and um, it's really wonderful to see them becoming more and more popular and getting you know, the public more aware of that. So that's a, a wonderful direction that we're all moving in. So to make a garden, a rain garden successful, we talked about it in the field a little bit earlier today, some things need to just be done right to make sure you know all your energy and goodwill doesn't turn into frustration in the field project that ends up being not successful so some things you know that are really important to keep in mind is to stay away from the from foundations you know at least about 10 feet away from that because you're dealing with water okay water looks tame if it comes out of your watering can but if we have a really strong storm or if frost freezes near the water and it thaws, it has a lot of power. So we don't want to make create any issues around our foundations and structures with rain gardens. That's why we need to stay away from you know, walls, houses, um, septic systems, that's really important. And we kind of talked about this out in the field today as well. Um, the other important thing is that we need to stay away from the drip lines of trees. So if we're digging into the soil and there's a big tree there with its root systems, we can do a lot of damage to that root systems. Even though we mean well with our rain gardens, it doesn't mean we can build them everywhere. If we destroy a tree's surface root system, which is probably the most um, sensitive part of a root system of a tree, then we can actually cause the tree to die over a couple of years. So these are some of the really important things that we need to keep in mind to make sure your rain garden is successful, okay? And then the other really, I can't say that enough important thing is that rain gardens are not wet gardens, okay? They're designed to drain. They're usually dry, okay? What we need to put a rain garden in a place is soil that drains really well, right? They're not bogs, they're not swamps. They're dry gardens, right? If they are wet, we get all kinds of issues. So when we select the site for a rain garden, very important at the beginning is to make sure you don't go for sites that are naturally soggy, right? That could be because of compaction. You know, if mowers drive over a soil many, many, many years, they compact it and they basically fill all these fine pores in the soil that guide water back down, right? They fill them up so that it's very hard for water to travel down. These sites are really difficult and usually require a little bit more help to make them drain again. And that, you know, can cost a lot of money. So if you stay away from soggy places in the first place, your rain garden will likely be a lot more successful than if you chose a site where water puddles, you know, long after a storm and it just sits there, okay? So that's really important. If you have a site like this where water puddles, then there are many other conservation landscapes that can be used to reduce that water by either letting plants take it up and transpire it back into the atmosphere through their leaf systems or other things like that. But a rain garden may not be the best solution for that. So I'm mentioning that here because there's still a lot of misunderstanding and confusion around where rain gardens should go. So keep in mind, they're not wet, they're meant to dry. So stay away from soggy places, very important. And the other thing that's really important um, when you select a location for your rain garden is to check what kind of water goes in it. So in this image here, you can actually see on the right that uh, this rain garden, it's indicated by a little uh, red circle there, collects a lot of water that carries fines, fine silt soil with it, right? And that soil can cause your rain garden to clog up. It can actually fill these fine pores that we talked about a few minutes ago with such fine sediment that your rain garden turns into a pond. And that's when we get issues with mosquitoes, it smells bad, we don't want that, right? So check it when it's raining or right after a storm, like today, this morning would have been a good time to check if the water that goes onto that site where you're thinking about maybe putting a rain garden, if that water is indeed clean or if it carries a heavy sediment load, which is what we call it in engineering terms. 
So if it does carry a lot of sediment like this, then um, a rain garden can still be done, don't get me wrong, but it's a little bit more involved. Okay, then we need all kinds of filter systems to keep that bad stuff out of it so it doesn't clog up and doesn't turn into a pond. That would be the worst that can happen. Okay, so sediment is something that um, you know we deal with in, in a lot of built landscapes. A lot of our trucks have soil on their you know, tires and you know, maybe a construction project uphill from us. There are a couple of different reasons why that can happen. So this is really important to keep in mind if you want to make sure your rain garden is successful. Okay. All right. The next really important thing is that your rain garden, it is designed to drain, right, to infiltrate water. If during the construction process, heavy machinery drives into that rain garden, that too causes compaction in the soil and it can actually reduce the percolation or infiltration capacity of your rain garden dramatically. So keeping machinery out as much as you can is really essential. You know, you may have a guy in your congregation saying, oh yeah, I've got this, you know, back hole, I'll take care of it, I'll dig the hole. Well, okay, but you can do this from the edge edges, but you are not allowed to drive your machine in there because repairing compaction like that can be really difficult, it can require a lot of money, and it can take a long time to heal a soil again, to get it to drain really well. Okay, so sometimes muscle power is the best. <laughs> Couple of shovels, you know, rain guards don't have to be super deep. It can be done. It can be a lot of fun. You just do a digging party, you know, with your volunteers. Uh, it looks worse than it is. We actually had a lot of fun digging this one here. You don't always need machinery to make this happen, okay? There's nothing wrong with digging away a few inches of soil. It's no problem, okay? It all depends on how much people you have uh, to help you, but usually a lot of fun. And then one of the last things that I see done a lot that can cause rain gardens to fail is that we put too much amendment in there. Let me warn you, a rain garden is not a vegetable garden. It is not about providing super good soil for your plants. A rain garden is there to filter all the excess nutrients and pollutants that come in with the rainwater out of that water. So if you put a lot of amendments in that soil and make it super rich, then it actually doesn't capture as much of that stuff. You actually put a lot of nutrients in there that then run off into the surrounding aquifer and ecosystems with that water. So in general, starve your plants. Keep them on a really low fertility level. The soil doesn't have to be black and super rich like in the vegetable garden. It can be totally lean and that will actually allow the plants to filter out more of these uh, substances that we want to get filtered out of the water. So in this case here, we actually used uh, a soil conditioner, and that's simply because we um, had mostly subsoil there, right? But that <laughs> there's a lot of plants that grow on subsoil. They just sometimes need a little bit of a kickstart. So we used just like a half an inch of compost to add some microbiology and some organic matter to that soil to improve the general growing conditions for the plants that were planted in there without amending that soil and making it super rich. So just like you know, a light kickstart, that's sometimes all it needs for plants to get their, their roots in the ground and be healthy. And that's exactly what this picture shows here thin layer of really high organic, rich material, and the plants, they grew like gangbusters. They absolutely loved it. If you did all this right, you can look at a fantastic rain garden. This is one that's only actually a year old. I took this picture really just a few weeks ago. What you see blooming there is Pacara aurea. It's one of our fabulous native wildflowers. And that water actually collects uh, a whole um, parking lot, the whole runoff from a parking lot, and filters that through a rich layer of uh, native species. It's a very clean design. Okay, You only see two species, but let me assure you there are at least 35 in there. Diversity doesn't always mean it needs to look messy and wild. Some of these things are hiding underneath the soft rush that we see there or appear later in the season. So it can have all kinds of different design styles. It doesn't have to be a really naturalistic mess. And we can definitely design something that is more, um, more pleasing, a little bit more legible, so that people feel more comfortable with it. And it doesn't always have to be 10 foot tall either. It can be you know, a short expression, something that you know, looks more designed and fits in with you know, the aesthetic that you expect from landscapes that surround us. 
So all kinds of different things are um, possible. Unfortunately, not all of the rain gardens or conservation landscapes and meadows that we um, are involved with or that you know, our customers use our plants for are successful. And uh, that's, a real <laughs> that's a real shame. But it is the reality, and I'm not here to, you know, say that rain gardens are easy and you know just throw some plants in there and it'll be great. It really is a, a scale project where you need professional help to make sure, at least in the early stages, while you're still learning about it, it's successful. So some of the projects I'm just showing them right here. Um, they just really make me sad when I see things like that. They're not successful rain gardens. If you have a rain garden that doesn't have any plants in it, well, it won't work, right? Because only plants can clean that water, can take up all these heavy metals and uh, excess nutrients in their cell tissue and take that out of the water. So without plants or with just a few plants in it, we're wasting our time. It's not working. We need them to be densely vegetated. Things like that are absolutely unacceptable, okay? Sorry, I'm being so harsh, but it's the truth. <laughs> they need to be absolutely, every inch needs to be filled with a plant. So if I see rain gardens like that, it just makes me sad because the plants aren't happy either. They're suffering, right? This is not how they grow in nature. This is really harsh conditions, you know, one set by the other, not really good. So whose fault is that? Is it the plant's fault? <laughs> no. no, exactly. Thanks, Naomi. Plants grow everywhere, okay? I'm sure you all could only agree, you know? When you walk outside here, they go in the little cracks out there in the pavement of that parking lot. When you drive home, you'll see them growing right in the middle of highways. They grow in gutters and wherever else you don't sweep your sidewalk, you have plants growing. So if a rain garden is not densely vegetated with plants, it's not their fault, it's usually our fault, right? So that's one of the challenges, you know? If I see plantings like that, it makes me really sad, right? Some of the plants have failed. And uh, the interesting thing is that if you don't vegetate your rain garden densely, then in all the gaps between your plants, maybe you space them a foot or two feet apart, you will have weeds coming up. And why is that? It is because bare soil is the most unnatural thing on this planet, at least in our part of the world it is. In the wild, every inch of soil is covered with a plant. Nothing grows in solitary confinement with three feet of mulch in between. Let me assure you, okay? But if we don't work with this, with this natural principle, this is how wild plant communities are wired, and put plants, you know, very far apart from, another, from one another, then we shouldn't be surprised if our gardens become weedy messes and may get out of control. Because you can see it right here between all these plants. See all these little grasses coming up? This is why we maintain our gardens so much. Because, to be honest, we just didn't put enough plants in there in the first place. And that's where a lot of our maintenance issues come from. From the fact that we just don't use enough plants or seed to really cover every inch of ground with a desired plant, okay? The fewer plants we use, the more weeding and maintenance we have to do. And unfortunately, mulch is not the solution. Mulch can be a temporary help that covers some of that soil until your plants are thick and cover every inch of soil with you know, another plant. But mulch on the long term will not work and it will not give you the water cleaning uh, capacity either that we need, especially in rain gardens. Okay, So think about that when you look at your landscapes. If you have something like this, maybe your garden, right? Maybe it's a commercial landscape right next to the gas station where you usually get gas. And you can see you know, all these plants side by side with mulch in between. This is ignoring how plants grow in the wild. And this is some of the reason why we have to maintain our gardens so much, okay? All of these plants that we use come from communities like that. This is how plants associate with one another in the wild. They don't grow in solitary confinement and they don't grow in monocultures either. They are social, they mingle with other plants. It looks complicated, and yes it is. This is what we do, you know, this is what we're trying to figure out as plant professionals. But let me assure you, 
There are some really basic principles behind plant communities that we can use when we plant our conservation landscapes or rain gardens. And these simple principles are, there's always a ground cover layer right there at the base of your soil. And these plants are not always pretty. Many of them are not commercially available. That's okay. They're there to control erosion. They're there to suppress weeds. They hold your soil in place. They do all that. And then between these plants, we have taller species, like your Joe Pie weeds, your echinaceas, all these wonderful wildflowers that give you all the pollinators and all these things. Some of them are great cut flowers. They grow like a second layer over top of that. It's almost like a layered lasagna or like a layered cake, okay? Got the icing on the top, right? This is how plants associate with one another in the wild. And if we can learn from that, and design plant communities like that, we can build much more functional and much lower maintenance gardens. This is a fantastic exhibit. If anybody is interested, it's actually at the US Botanic Garden right now. It's called Exposed, the Secret Life of Roots. And you can see the work of um, Dr. Jerry Glover from the University of Kansas. He dug profiles, soil profiles in prairies that show you how deep root systems of plants are and how they all fit together. You can beautifully see here in the picture on the right, these layers, you know, all these grasses you have there at the soil base and then these taller species over top of that. And you're probably wondering, how does that work? When you buy a plant in a garden center, right? It says on the label, space two feet apart, right? Should I just ignore that? Well, not necessarily. If you planted, you know, that tall Joe Pie weed I showed you earlier, closer than maybe three feet together, because they're all the same, and they all grow to the same height, and they all have the same root system, they would outcompete each other, right? But what if I planted one here, one there, and then short vegetation in between to cover their feet? That's what we're talking about, right? Using ground covers and short plants in between to make this work. It's nothing but adapting what nature does and has been doing for millions of years, okay? And I can guarantee you, if you, not in a complicated way, but in a simple way, try to work with that when you're designing your gardens, you will be a happier gardener. And you actually get time to sit in your garden and read a book and not have to read all the time. So probably one like me, I'm a lazy gardener. It's not all about the leaves and the flowers we see. 70-80% of some of these species have all their biomass underground. This is where all the magic happens, right? And the cool thing is your rain gardens, right, when they're vegetated densely, and in the fall, all the plants die off, all your perennials, right? What we don't always understand is that many of their root systems also die back in the fall. And what that does is it leaves behind an ro empty root channel. Wherever there was a root, there's this tiny little channel, right, where the biomass is decomposing. And over time, these millions of root channels can make a soil like a sponge. They can even make a compacted soil so porous that your rain garden will drain in no time. So designs like this, right, that may show you plant cover. Look at the big circles, right? It looks like that soil is 100% covered, right? But you should always ask, well, what's growing underneath that shrub, right? What's covering their feet? Where are the roots, right, that infiltrate more water and clean more water right there? It can't be mulch. Mulch does nothing for water cleaning there. So some of these things we're, we're trying to change and you know, basically combine our horticultural planting method with some of the principles that are coming from wild plant communities to design better conservation landscapes and help you, you know, love your plantings and help them to be less maintenance. So it could look like something like this, right? In maybe more of a shaded conservation uh, landscaping setting where you have this thick ground cover there, you have your grasses growing right over top of that. So it's not one beside the other, it is one on top of the other. That's how this works, okay? This is another example right here where you can see two companion species showing exactly the same footprint, no mulch, no soil uncovered, and very little space for weeds. This is what we're trying to reach. This is where we're trying to go. And then what I also wanted to say too, when we talk plant cover, we're not only talking summer, right? Your rain gardens also get a lot of water in the wintertime. 
what if the snow melts, right? Or we get some of these freak storms in the middle of February. Something needs to hold that water and something needs to prevent er uh, erosion. If a rain garden looks like this in the middle of February, a lot of soil washes off. This is not good, right? And it doesn't have to be that way. Because there are, believe me, thousands of plants, thousands of native plants that have evergreen basil leaves that are green even in the off season. If you don't believe me, next winter, walk your garden. Check all these things out. Things like you know, the tufted hair grass, some of your cold flowers, um, l cardinal flower, they all have leaves in the middle of winter. And that's really important to cover that soil all year long to make sure that um, we're not you know, letting any sediment wash into uh, the aquifer from your rain garden. So this is a winter shot of a well done rain garden. You can see it's almost just as green as in the summer. This is what I think is a really well done design. So in order to do this, you need a lot of plants, okay? So one of the recommendations I have, use the smallest plant size as possible. You know, sometimes it's really hard to plant so densely with, uh, quart, uh, with gallons and, and larger two gallons and three gallon plants. So ask for quartz and even ask for landscape plugs and don't be shy to use seed either. These are all concepts that we can work out as we get in more into the planting design uh, phase. Plug installation, we'll go through that real quick. And once you have it densely planted, what's most important is to get your vegetation established as quickly as you can. This is um, a bioswale that filters water as it flows through it. And you can see here, it was actually planted in April of 2008 on the left. And then the picture on the right shows that same planting in August of the same year. This is what we want to do. We wanted to cover that soil as quickly with a plant we want Right? And basically, we want to be faster than the weeds, right? Yeah, <laughs> I think everybody agrees on that. Um, to make sure these rain gardens don't become any maintenance nightmares or a meadow, or whatever conservation landscape might work for your site. So covering soil as quickly as you can, with as many plants as you can, is one of the recipes to success. And you will like the results, I can tell you that. And then beyond that, it's management, okay? And that's something that um, we always talk about very early in the process. No rain garden and no conservation is ever landscape is ever maintenance free. There are a lot of things that need to happen to keep your planting as beautiful as you envision it, right? And make sure it doesn't turn into a weed patch, make sure it develops well. So um, I have um, a little um, cheat sheet here for um, you know, a couple points that need to be checked when you're checking rain gardens or other conservation landscapes to make sure you're really thinking of all the things that need to be monitored and to make sure you see all the signs that require action, right, in your rain garden. So, because you're dealing with water and a lot of disturbance and sometimes plant pellets, even if they're well researched, don't work out, right? It happens a lot that at least a small percentage of the plants that we plant there just don't like the site, right? In this case here, has a lot to do with the salt load uh, that was coming in from the parking lot. But after the first year, a lot of plants had failed. So what do you do when something like this happens, right? Do you throw mulch at it? No, exactly. <laughs> you replant it. You fill the gaps as soon as you can with a slightly different plant palette to repair it, to restore that dense plant cover that we need for a rain garden to be successful, right? So in this case here, we had a couple of volunteers, some really energetic uh, ladies and gentlemen that helped us with that, and we filled all the gaps with plants, and then only a year later, we had a rain garden that was uh, completely full and beautiful and lush and had much fewer weeds. There are a couple in there, still needs some maintenance. But you know, it was we restored its functionality. We brought the plants back that are so essential in any kind of conservation landscape or rain garden. So when you get there, you can enjoy not only all the wildlife, the colors, you can get people excited about it. You can feel proud of it. You know, it's a really good feeling to look at you know conservation landscape and meadows sit in there and see that yeah you know we gave something back. You know that that's a very gratifying thing. And then on top of that, when it rains, you get to enjoy your rain garden. This one right here, we actually designed that at Mount Cuba Center, and it shows you so beautifully how it reacts when it rains and all that water flows in there. This was a rain event that kept going for you know, almost a day and a half. 
and it kind of goes back and it rains again and it fills up again. And then it infiltrates and it goes right back into the ground. And that's the most beautiful thing. You know, it gets cleaned by all the plants. It goes right back into the ground, filtered, and all of this water is not going into the bay. So that's what you should aim for. And if you get there, it's the most amazing thing. Mm -hmm.